Hey fam, it's Mariah, and welcome to Calvary Conversations, where we simplify God's word to reach today's culture by casting down arguments through real, radical testimonies and biblical conversations. Now let's get started. Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah Riley, and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig. Woo! All right, so today we are going to interview a very special guest speaker, and this is actually our first interview in a while because yeah. I've been on maternity leave and my baby Micaiah is crying and screaming in the other room <laughs> yeah. right now, but this is, we're excited to talk about, well, Morgan's taking care of her, so she's not all by herself, yeah, yeah. but we're excited to talk about saving babies' lives, so... Um, before we get started, we want to introduce our guest speaker. So mm. you want to say his name? <laughs> Maison Dijon. <laughs> Is that good? That right? uh, I love I heard him say it that way. It was so cool. Does anyone think yeah. right. us, us gringos say Mason, but he said it's Maison yeah. Dijon. So I like that. But that. Mason, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. Yes. Yeah. All right. So before we get started, we'll have my dad pray for Let's us. Pray. And then Father, we just thank you for you and for all that you've done for us. And I just thank you for Mason and his ministry and just for all the radical things he does for you in love. And so, Father, we just pray you'll bless this conversation. You'll lead us to speak on the things you want us to really touch on. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just guide us, lead us, and just give us your insights. And we pray, Lord, that this uh, time would uh, really touch people and encourage them to be radical for you also. So, Lord, we love you. And as your word says, whatever you commit to the Lord, it shall be established. And we pray that your will be done in this podcast. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sure. All right. Well, uh, we usually ask the question who you are and what you do. With some rumors going around <laughs> that you are the friendly neighborhood <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> but um, if you would like to share just a little bit, a summary for those who don't know who you are. Yeah, so I climb skyscrapers <laughs> to raise money for women in crisis pregnancy and save babies from being murdered by abortion. Mm -hmm. I also do lots of activism and speaking, trying to educate churches and that kind of thing. Mm, cool. So also, so at Calvary Conversations, we love to get people's testimony. That's a big thing because we love the verse in Revelation where it says they overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And we definitely see that from you because <laughs> you are willing to die yeah. and you don't see that a lot. And so let's just talk about how you got into what you do now and just a little bit about your life. Yeah, so I'd always been pro-life. I grew up Catholic and, um, you know, Catholic, you don't have any of the word. You know, you have this idea of like morality is good, but it, it, it's missing something, right? Yeah. And I kind of always knew that because um, as much as we were taught to love Jesus and, and love the Bible, we never actually read the mm -hmm. Bible. Maybe like a two verses in mass they might read and the priest will say them all uh you know in his priest voice yeah. and they just kind of go in one ear and out the other and never truly understand what what he was saying and when you finally pick up the bible and you try to read it on your own you look at all the names of these places and it, and it seems like they're like these mythical mm -hmm. cities in like the lord of the rings or something <laughs> yeah. with the hobbit and then come to find out they're all real places. Yeah. They all exist. And so growing up Catholic, I was just missing that. And I say like, faith is, is the boat that you're on. It's, if you're on the river, right. It's, it's going to keep you from sinking mm -hmm. of course, but without the word, without knowing truly who, who Christ is, it's like, what good is your faith in, in reality? It's, you're, you're going to spin in circles and go the, the wrong direction. And it's, it, it is, it's a problem. Yeah. And, and so I, uh, in high school, we moved from California, from Michigan to California to LA and I, I couldn't stand LA. Yeah, and so I, last day of school, I, I, I climbed a little bit here and there. And the last day of school, I threw everything in my car and I left to Yosemite, California. Mm -hmm. And that was where I really started to rock climb. But obviously Yosemite, it's, kind of a bad place if anyone's ever been there and spent any kind of time there it's um 
a, a very rock and roll, if you mm. will. So it's, it's not the best place to, to live and, and, and prosper unless you're solely devoted to climbing. And, and luckily, climbing for a time sort of pulled me away from the culture that was there because, you know, you can't participate in all the bad things if you're too busy climbing mountains, mm. <laughs> thankfully. Yeah. Um, but I eventually I moved to Las Vegas after Yosemite and I was sitting at home one day just on my phone and I seen these photos and it, it was a photo of a baby. And normally when you see photos of babies, they have bows on their heads and, 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 and things like that. But this baby, she sat in a Ziploc container with a smashed skull and one eye left open. And it was a baby that was killed by abortion. And like I said, I'd always been pro-life, but now that I'm suddenly like seeing what it means to be pro-life, like what I'm actually opposing, uh, my heart was just so convicted. Yeah. And the way I describe it, it it's like um, in, in James, it says, those who are hearers, but not mm -hmm. doers of the word are like, then look at themselves in the mirror and then walk away and immediately forget who they mm -hmm. are. And that's how I felt. I was like, if, if I don't do something about this, who really am I? Mm. Because until you see the victims of abortion, you don't really understand what it is. But once you do, you can understand that what we're talking about is not just some political cause mm. that's nice and fluffy and we can support. It's not something that's bad, like a, a, a nose ring or a tattoo. <laughs> it, it is a holocaust. Amen. Amen. And so I, I wanted to do something radical to kind of um, make a statement. And, and the funny thing is, is that um, I, I had never done anything for the pro-life movement at all. I had no idea any of the players in the game or how it works. And um, I just knew that I wanted to do something. So as a climber, I stole this idea from another climber. His name's Alain Robert. He's known as the French Spider-Man and in, in in 2008, he had climbed the New York Times building to protest climate change. So my mission became to climb these skyscrapers and get the word out um, about these babies that had been murdered in the womb and, and, and try to save more babies like them and, and bring these babies justice, really. Um, and so I had planned and planned. I, I couldn't think of anything else. I have, I have terrible, terrible OCD. So when I get fixated on something, that's, that's all I can think about. And for months, all I could think about was, you know, doing something to help these babies. And I had raised some money so I could buy plane tickets and pay a photographer. And it was pretty funny raising the money because I had started with the pro-life organizations. And of course, uh, in hindsight, I guess they probably came off as something like a Nigerian prince, right? Mm. Like if you can donate some money to me. I'll go climb these skyscrapers and raise all this other money mm -hmm. to help these babies. And of course, it's ideas seem so ridiculous to someone who doesn't rock climb yeah, exactly. and can't comprehend the, the reality of what's going on. But uh, yeah, I, I raised the money and I bought the tickets. And then the morning I woke up to climb the Salesforce tower, I, I wake up in the morning and I check my phone and it says that the Dobbs draft was leaked. Mm -hmm. The, the the draft that overturned Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have planned it. It was just this stroke of divine providence. Mm -hmm. And it was like God patting me on mm -hmm. the back saying, keep going. You know, like this is this is right. And um so I climbed the first building, right? The Salesforce mm -hmm. Tower. And of course in San Francisco you can pretty much get away with murder. <laughs> so they That's what good they is. let me out of jail and like so I got on a plane and I flew straight to New York City to climb the New York Times building, just like Alain Robert had done. And on my flight, there was this guy that had messaged me and he said that, oh, I uh, run a ministry. I'm from New Zealand. And I was wondering if I could interview you. And I didn't know who this guy was. I didn't do any research. I was just like, yeah, sure, I'll do an interview. And um, so... I climbed the New, York, uh, the New York Times building, and when I got to the top of that one, there were no police waiting for me because I had climbed it so early in the morning, <laughs> and nobody in New York actually looks up. So That's I got true. to the top. They're New York. 
like, well, I guess I just let myself out. And I walked down the 52 flights of stairs and walked back to my hotel. And I got on this interview with this guy named Ray Comfort. Mm -hmm. And he starts the interview off with, have you ever lied? Mm -hmm. He does this thing. It's called the good person test. Mm -hmm. And I know we were talking about this before we started and, uh, most people, you said you didn't. You said, <laughs> what would you say? You thought your evil is... A day's long, yeah. <laughs> yes, a day's yeah. long. But most people think that they're good Amen. people, and that's what I thought. Yeah. You know, I thought I was saved because I was a Catholic, and I was baptized, and I'd uh, done my confirmation, and I'd go to confession once every in a while. And um, so we think we're good people, but you know, the requirement to get into heaven is not just to be a good person, but it's, it's this perfection. Amen. And as good as we think we are, uh, the example that Ray had actually used, he said, you know, um, when you take a, a sheep's wool and you have this sheep sitting in um, a green pasture, yeah, the, the sheep looks white, but as suddenly, um, as soon as you compare him to snow, mm. all of a sudden the wool looks dirty mm. and, that's what we are. As much as we think we're these good people, mm -hmm. no, our, our hearts are they're totally depraved. And until we have Jesus Christ, we're going to keep, um, you know, sinking farther and farther into our, into our depravity. Mm -hmm. And um, thankfully I did that, that interview with him. And you said um, you kind of got mad from right? then, at first. You're like, who is this guy? Oh, right? I was <laughs> yeah. like, you ever lied? You ever stolen? And I'm, in my mind as a Catholic, I was like, who is this legalist, right? Because that's the word that that's real Christians get called. We get called legalists. Yeah. And so that's what I was thinking. But uh, like a week went by and I thought back to it. And I'm like, you know, I think like this guy makes a point. Mm. Like what's, what, what is the point of believing in this book, but not believing in, in it fully? Yeah. If it says not to do these things, you know, it's one thing to do it accidentally, but why are we going to openly do these things so lewdly? Yeah. Um, and so from from there, I was like, I, I need to know more. And so I went to a Bible study that a friend had invited me to many times. And I remember we read, um, I think it's in John, where, where Peter walked on water. Mm. And I was like, wait, Peter walked on water too? Because... Mm. You know, as a Catholic, you, don't know. you only know yeah. the story here yeah. in like the children's Bible, you know, like Jesus walked on the water, David and Goliath, yeah. Jonah and the whale, Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. Like that's, or you, I don't know if you your, have it, but the Jerusalem Bible, you have it on your, on your coffee table, but you never touched it. It was kind of like a good luck charm. I don't know. We had a big Jerusalem Bible on our, yeah. and we never touched it ever. Yeah. You, you really have the knowledge of a child yeah. and nothing more. Mm -hmm. And so after I, had seen that like wait you know this peter guy walked on water I, I called myself a christian my whole life i should have known that um i, I went to a calvary chapel calvary red rock okay. that my friend was going to and uh we read the book of samuel it was on a tuesday we do old testament on tuesday and we're reading the book of samuel about david and, and here i am in this place that's you know similar to david i'm up against uh, goliath <laughs> really is what the abortion Man, is yeah. and the law is coming after me you've got people sending me death threats and i'm reading about this david guy but i noticed the title of the book isn't the book of david mm. it's the book of samuel mm. and i'm like who's this samuel guy <laughs> that they would have to name a book after him like i've called myself a christian my entire yeah. life and i don't even know who this samuel guy is mm. and just the way that my pastor pastor greg was going through um you know, the story of David and, and making it understandable verse by verse. I, I just connected with yeah. it. And, and almost right away, I was like, okay, cool. these guys are right. I'm wrong. Yeah. And yeah, and it was, it was a little more than that, I guess yeah. too, because I was still kind of holding on to Catholicism. Was because, it just a tradition um, of it? Just cause it's your, that's what you know, it is. That's the way. Yeah. Feel, yeah it, so you it, feel it, like it, you're betraying your faith, you know, kind of it's weird. Right feels like you're betraying your family yeah 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 because you're I was your real close to my family tradition. so it was easy to portray that but you know because i my family's <laughs> kind of weird but you know so anyway yeah yeah it's amazing but, the tradition yeah, I, in it me, you know 
well, that's, yeah, it's designed to be that way. And it's, it's sad because, you know, what, what Catholics do is they know they're missing something. And rather than looking towards the word and looking towards understanding who Jesus Christ is and, uh, you know, these stories that were left to us in the Old Testament, rather than reading that, they drift farther and farther into, into tradition. They think that like, oh, something feels wrong. It must be because my mass isn't in Latin, mm. you yeah. know? And, and so they will start to go to Latin mass and they think that, oh yes, this has been fixed. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. Yeah. The, the one thing I do appreciate of, uh, and this has to do with liturgy, not the Catholic is, is the quietness. Mm. I, I think not enough churches do that enough. And so I, at home, I try to get on my knees and pray. Mm. Uh, but that's, you know, yeah. I don't have to yeah. hear a, a Latin mass to be able to get on my knees and and, and pray yeah. that, and be in, in quiet. That's what I always saw with my grandma. It was like she got saved at the end but of her life, but she said, I miss the high church. I miss the candles and the stain, you know, because Calvary's pretty, pretty, you know, we don't do all that. So she said that was just I, so I hard for me. And I just said, well, and what I've noticed, and I didn't want to, I'm not dogging Catholics, right? I love, there's a lot of, I believe there's some saved Catholics, right? But it's, the thing is, it seems like when you're kind of bad, you like all the liturgy and the high church because it kind of makes you feel good. But when you really have a relationship with Jesus, you don't need all that. I think, like you said, the quietness, mm -hmm. be still and know that I'm God, Forever. that's good, right? Because we're too fast-paced in this world. But I think, yeah. is, you know, I realize, you know, it's sort of like a, like it says, you know, uh, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 5, that in the last days people have a form of godliness but deny the power. It's like we kind of like the form, a lot of form. But when you really have a relationship, you don't need all that form. You know what I mean? I still, like, I agree I, with I you agree. in the sense of be still because you need to wait on the Lord and not just talk to him, but you need to listen and hear what he, as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and not listen to the voice of another. And so we need to do that. But I, I, I it's just funny how you'll see old Catholics where they go, I kind of miss the stained glass. I kind of miss the candles. I miss the, the priestly robes and stuff, but you know, I don't know. I think I'm so big. If I put a black robe on, I look like Darth Vader. So I don't know if you get that. Good idea. Well, but. yeah. I mean like the, the stained glass and, and the beauty of the churches is something that it that is, um, I, I think a, a good thing, right? And um, like I, I like R.C. Sproul a lot, and he talks about like the design of the cathedrals to the point where there'd be stained glass even where no one could see yeah. it, and it was because this was not made for man, but it was made to honor God. Mm. But at the same time, we have to realize that this is a a luxury that if we can have it, then we will do it to the best of our ability to honor God. But at the same, if we can have it, then let the jail cell be our, our chapel, yeah. right? Yeah. Like the, at the end of the day, this church is a building and we can't make an idol out of yeah. it. Exactly. Like these things like the stained glass and the high church, the, the candles and the robe, like I think they're beautiful. And, and the, the, the silence of it is, is beautiful but it cannot be an idol Amen. and that's the problem is that the catholic church makes them an idol yeah. just just um, like this, so you're not doing it this yeah. way just like the 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 israelites made the the bronze serpent mm -hmm. they started worshiping it you know even though it was used to help uh, keep them from dying you know if they would look upon it but we like to worship stuff and that's why we have to always keep it a relationship where we don't worship the subs the stuff but the subs of jesus you know it's not about a church and yeah it's so easy to do i mean it's like my pastor he uh they had a pretty big church here in tucson and he said i actually loved every brick of this church and we have to remember the church is not so much the building as is the people right it's mm -hmm. jesus and the people loving mm -hmm. him and so yeah so how did you so Ray kind of roughed you up and said, <laughs> showed you you weren't a good person. And so how, how long was the process? So you said a week later, you realized he's right. So did, how hard was it for you? Because like I said, I, I had no problem <laughs> believing I was a bad person. I just had to lie. I don't know if you want to talk to this. It's probably not your thing. But I believed I had to, as a Catholic, get good and then receive Jesus. I couldn't just come mm. as a drug dealer, as a thug, and go, okay, God, I'm, I messed up. Save me. I thought... You know, as a good Catholic, I had to earn, like I had to do penance and be good. And then God would say, okay, you're good enough. I, I guess I'll let you in. You know, I'll let you hang out with me. And so I didn't really, how did, how did that work for you? Or did you not have that? 
No, it was almost like overnight. I was, it took a week. And once I decided that this is it, that's all I focused on. The OCD for kicked a, in. A, a very, right? <laughs> the OCD kicked Yeah. That's good. Yeah. It was, Jesus is it. It was, uh, yeah. A divine thing. Yeah. And, and, um, well, that's, that's where I was after, too. It just took, what I'm trying to say, it took me about a year to understand the grace of God. Like it's like I, someone had this workspace thing where it took me a year to realize I'm bad. Like, I mean, I know it's bad, but meaning I can't do anything to earn God's favor. That's what yeah. it took me. So, but when, like you, once I received Christ, my life was changed radically overnight. Yeah. Part of it was for me is I had embarked on this, just such an outrageous mission. Mm-hmm. And my life was changing so fast. And I knew that I needed God Mm. if I was going to be successful mm. because when I, when I climbed the Salesforce tower, I felt like I was burning the ships behind me. Mm. Um, you know, like when Cortez came yeah. uh, to the Americas, he knew his men would get homesick. So he, he set the boats yeah. on fire so that they couldn't go home. And that's how I felt. I'm like, I dug myself a hole and the only way out was to, you know, keep digging and learn Chinese and pop out on the other side. Yeah. Um, and so I, I knew I needed God. And so it wasn't like this thing I was struggling mm. with. It was like, no, this is, this, this is, is the truth and I need to follow it. Mm. After that happened, just so many weird things started happening in my life to the people I met and got connected with. And I was lucky that um, I met these two guys who are now like my best friends and we call each other all the time and hang out all the time. But uh two godly men to disciple. Oh, cool. And uh, that's the biggest thing I think I recommend Amen. to new Christians Amen. is find a godly man to disciple yeah. one that's going to give you the time of day. Cause yeah. sometimes, you know, pastors, they get busy and they're, um, they're going to brush off some of their congregation, which I think is the sad yeah. thing, but find an elder yep. that has the time to, yeah. uh, you know, fellowship with you and, 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 and invite you yeah. over to their house and have dinner with them and just latch on to those people. Yeah. And that's the great thing about it. That's what we say. You know, you always want in church, you don't want to make up, you know, everyone's going, what's your vision? And I said, my vision is to do the will of God. And what did Jesus say? Go and make disciples of all nations, teach them to obey all that I command you. And I, I've been saying this a lot lately because even in Calvary, we have, we do expositional teaching. We have great teachers, but as Paul said, you have 10,000 instructors, but few fathers. And what the church really mm-hmm. needs today is not just good teaching. It needs good teaching. But it also needs fathers that come alongside young, older men come along, younger men and older women come along, young as it says in Titus two, uh, uh, with women, and we really teach, we we pass it down and really walk beside because we don't, you know, yes, can you do it with just Jesus and the Word? But we also need some flesh to sort of spur us on, as it says in Hebrews, to love and good deeds. And I see that is my indictment because I'm a pastor for forty three years is that we don't have a lot of spiritual fathers and mothers out there. And we need that because Mm -hmm. like you said, think of how I think you would concur, right? That how much that helped in your growth with Christ is to have someone to really pray with you, to show you how to pray, to show you to really say, Oh, this scripture might apply to what you're going through. And uh, yes. Can you find that with the Lord? Yeah, you can just you and Lord, but sometimes you need some humans to help that. And I think that's, we're kind of, like they say, we're the most connected society yet the most disconnected. And I think we need to learn, they say, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, millennials, they say that 25% of them have never been married. And they say, this is Prager. He said, because they don't know how to communicate one-on-one, they don't know how to talk face to face with someone. So they can't, you know, and we need to get that back in the church. Maybe the world won't do it, but we should be doing it. Amen. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing that helped me too was um, because of like the nature of the work that I'm doing, it, it made me force me to travel a lot. Mm-hmm. So I was never home and I was able, it was really easy for me to leave my worldly friends behind. Mm-hmm. And this is going to make a lot of new Christians mad, mm-hmm. but you have to make new friends yep. when Amen. you become a Christian. Yep. You cannot be around the same exactly. people that you were uh, a part of the world with. Yeah. They will drag you down. Amen. You have to find new friends. And you're going to, you know, for me, I, had, I learned that um, because when I went back home and I was hanging out with my old friends, I noticed like, oh gosh, I like just started swearing again. Mm-hmm. Like it was no big, it just came yeah. back like riding a bicycle. Yeah. 
and and that's why the, the so, yeah, Corinthians fifteen, First Corinthians fifteen, bad company corrupts good morals. You know, yeah. we need that example. Absolutely. So, yeah. So. yeah, and it does make me sad too because I see a lot with the conservative movement. Like this was a big thing for me. Like especially before I was married, and like there's like even this guy that I was like, oh, he's super conservative, and he voted for Trump, and like he was like even homeschooled, and like he does things like the way that I'd want to. But they could have this, like, good old boy mentality where it's just, like, we cuss, we drink, we do all this stuff, but, like, no relationship with Jesus. It's just, no like, he's kind of, like, an afterthought. And so I think that's something that I've really seen is just, like, it's cool when you see people who are radical not only for the movement but for the Lord. Like, they're on fire because the Bible says you're either hot or cold. Yeah, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out. So. That is something that I think what really inspires people when it's not just like, oh, we're saving babies, but I'm also doing this and partying and I have like this worldly life where I'm just in sexual immorality and all this stuff. Like mm. maybe I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that or what that was like with your friends and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, I call conservatism pretend salt. <laughs> right? That's good. It's, it's just, wow. Yeah. It's this yeah. faithless morality. Yeah. It's this idea that – yeah. You know, if, if we only just, uh, you know, go back to traditional values and families that we can uh, bring back society. And that's not mm -hmm. the case, mm -hmm. because in order to have this traditional uh, family structure and um, this orderly society, we need Christ. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our nation was designed to exist um, as a Christian nation. I mean, mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin said that, uh, you know. Um, nations without virtues are incapable of freedom. Mm -hmm. And so we have to realize that. Yeah. And then they say, they um, said also we need religion to be able to do this because the only way we can be self-governed is being governed by God. Amen. Yeah. And it was a requirement for um, states or territories to become states to have religion. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of the requirements yeah. and that's why you see the um, insanity right where guys can be yeah, girls and girls yeah. can be guys and guys can have babies because there's no absolute truth and the only real absolute truth as we know is the word of god so everything's relative if you don't and, believe that yeah and that's that's the problem is before we used to ask the question when we were doing pro-life um you know apologetics it's it's really you start with pro-life and then it always leads back to jesus and that's just kind of like the the um foot in the door yeah. But we would start with like, well, when do you think life begins? Mm -hmm. And that question was good enough because, you know, it's just sort of implied that human life is valuable. Mm -hmm. But now we don't ask that question. We ask, does human life have value at all? Mm -hmm. And what gives it value? Yeah. Because without this idea that we were created in the image of God, then human life really doesn't have exactly. any value at all. Yeah. We're just stardust floating yeah. in space exactly. and nothing now. Yeah. yeah. What's what's the point? Yeah. And, and, and that's and why like I always think it's funny. funny. Evolution, if it's survival of the fittest, then we should kill weak things. You know, right? We should kill baby. We should kill stuff that isn't like if someone's mentally challenged, you're right, because it's all about a superior race mm. developing. And so it, it, it really is about death, right? That's how it comes. Evolution is yeah. things dying off that are weak and the strong survive. And so it's just, it, it is all about death in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, abortion it was created um, as a eugenics movement mm -hmm. by Margaret yeah. Sanger. She used to she be in Tucson. Was, Did you know that? Yeah. She was in Tucson. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was a, a honorary member of the Ku Klux Klan yeah. because women weren't allowed to be members of the Ku Klux Klan, and she was pen pals with Adolf Hitler, and yeah. she wanted to kill the blacks, the Slavs, and the Jews. And she got that from, she got that from, uh, what's his name, from, uh, who's the guy, uh, Evolution, uh, Darwin. Darwin. Remember his origin of species and showed the darker you were, the the more the more unevolved you were, or devolved, so you needed to be whiter to be more evolved. So they've changed that. I guess the title of the book's been changed, but the original book, was pretty much that's what motivated Margaret, right? That book. Yeah, and they try to tell this lie too that Margaret Singer was against abortion, mm -hmm. and it was true somewhat. She, uh, it, it, before Planned Parenthood was Planned Parenthood, it was the American Birth Control League, mm -hmm. and she saw birth control as a prevent, uh, a prevention tool to prevent abortion. Yeah. 
but that only applied to white people mm -hmm. because she didn't want to kill white babies. Yeah. She was completely fine with abortion for blacks, Slavs, and Jews. Yeah. She was. Is that true? Evil. That's, that's true, that's, right? That that abortion clinics are predominantly in black neighborhoods. Isn't that still true? Yeah. That there's a lot of it's yeah, really impoverished. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah, so it's yeah, still I mean, there. In, in New York, there were in 2016 there were more black people killed by abortion than were born. Mm. And so, yeah. you know, we're exterminating races yeah. today in America, and that's I guess where the radicalism comes out of. Like with what I do is that, you know, if if we say we're pro-life, we're saying that abortion is murder, yeah. and if that's the case, then it's over 70 million babies murdered since Roe v. Mm. Wade alone. Um, this is a Holocaust. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. How, how can we, like, you see it all the time. Like, we people want to put themselves, you know, fictionally as if they were in Nazi Germany. Like, what would I do mm. if, I, yeah. if I was there? Yeah. And we don't even have to do that thought experiment because you are in Nazi yeah. Germany yeah. right yeah. now. You are in a nation that is legalizing uh, abortion until the day of birth. Mm. And those who speak out against it, it's it's not just oh we're gonna make this legal, but it's no we're going to punish those who speak out against it. Yeah. And you're seeing um, it's called the Face Act. It, it's freedom of access to clinic entries, and it's this law that prevents people from doing sit-ins at abortion clinics. So you have the same country that will build statues of Martin Luther King Jr., a man known for sit-ins, will put pro-lifers in prison mm. for 11 years for doing sit-ins. Mm -hmm. So they're not just promoting abortion, they are silencing silencing those who speak for good and truth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it's I, I think it's crazy when you guys came to our church. I forget what's the doctor's name who did the abortions used to? Anthony Leventino. Anthony Leventino. When I saw the forceps and he said how pulling babies like arms off and legs off, it just rocked me. I mean I'm thinking you know, it's just weird how, and maybe you can talk about it, but it's just so weird how if we can't see it, that's cool. Mm -hmm. But if you ever thought like that, because my kids, two of my kids have had babies, what, one's six months old, one's three. And I'm thinking, I'm a pretty big dude. I could tear the arm off of my granddaughter. But if I did that, people would just freak. Like that would be the most uncrazy. how could, you, you need to go to jail for the rest of your life or be killed. But yet inside a womb, somehow it's yeah. fair game. And then when, it, when you guys showed that or he showed that, and then the popping the skull and the white fluid, I just it just made me cry because I just went, how? It's like somehow we believe this lie that if we can't see it, it's cool to do that, to do that, that, that her horrible atrocity. But somehow outside the womb, that's terrible. And it's just so weird to me. And I always say this. I think it's Double funny. I say, this, I say this to my liberal aunt. I say, you know, because she's a professor at a university. And I say, so if I get drunk and I drive my car and hit a woman who's pregnant, I can be charged for vicar manslaughter. So you're not just saying to a woman that you have the right to choose. You have the right to determine worth precious baby right no one says calls her baby a fetus when they love it but it's just a fetus when you want to have abortion but then the same thing in the national organization of women when they were saying i don't know how many years ago but beijing would do the sonogram and see it's a girl and they'd abort it well here they said it's just a fetus but there they said it's discrimination against women so i asked my head is there something about the international dateline that makes it from just a fetus to a precious a girl that's being discriminated against and she would just go <laughs> and she'd scoff i'd say well, learn me. I'm a deplorable. I'm an idiot. You're a, you got a doctorate. Explain to me. And I just think it's just so weird how we don't, you can just tell it's so spiritual because these people that say they're so smart can't see that, wait, it's a baby. I, I like what, I'm sorry, I've said a lot of things. I want to hear your take on all this, but I like what uh, Bill Maher said. He goes, abortion is murder. There's no question about it. I just hate babies, so I just hate children, so it's cool. But, I mean, this is Bill Maher saying it is a murder. There's no question about it. So, but I just, it's just, I mean, I know you know more about it than I do, but it's just insanity to me The ins that, that, like, if I tore, like I said, if I tore one of my daughter's, my little granddaughter's arms off, that's would be unforgivable to even secular people. But somehow in a womb, a doctor pulling arms off and popping heads, is totally acceptable and i just 
that's just that hit me when you guys showed that that just rocked me like I've never been rocked and I saw the movie I don't know if you've seen the movie it's an old old movie but it was called Silent Screams where they put the saline solution and you see the baby screaming I saw that but and that hit me but somehow just picturing taking big forceps and that just really rocked me so yeah mm. yeah and have you ever read uh Nietzsche's parable of the madman no no it's it's where the the phrase god is dead comes oh, from oh yeah i knew Nietzsche said that yeah yeah and so it says god is dead and we have killed him mm. and then he goes on to make his point that everybody from here on after will be a part of a sort of higher order right like they themselves will become gods in order to replace the god that they've killed and and it goes back to you know satan's lie in the garden may ye be their own gods yeah. right you know we create our own truth this this idea of relativism but um you know if you ask someone like does truth exist mm. like like is is there such thing as absolute truth and they'll say no mm. but it's a paradox because you know in order for that statement to be true, yeah, exactly. then absolute yeah. truth absolutely must sure there's exist. No truth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There must yeah. be truth. Exactly. There, there's no other way to go about yeah. it. And so, yeah, I mean, like, you know, then, then it is like, okay, well, you know, uh, what is truth? Yeah. Is it, uh, you know, something that this guy makes up on the spot mm. that, um, you know, I, I can do what I want, whatever I want, or is it this book uh that's full of these prophecies fulfilled that uh you know we can see visible miracles and that's what the you know atheists want to deny they want to deny that miracles exist yet their whole uh idea of creation exists around one <laughs> yeah. miracle the fact that something we decided to be, uh, nothing, nothing decided to be something <laughs> yeah. You know. yeah and it, it is a, a spiritual battle just yeah. like you were saying it goes back to satan in the garden and, you know, after the fall of man, you see that very quickly the people started worshiping two false idols, uh, Baal and Molech, mm -hmm. the god of sex and the god of child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And they would take their children and they would burn them on the altar of Molech. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, well, what do you think we were doing with our babies today after we kill them? Yeah, exactly. Did, did you hear about, to, uh, you know about the, this is, you probably maybe know more about it than I do. But in uh, right next to us in um, New Mexico, they actually do satanic. Remember, they have the abortion thing where they're yeah. offering the child yeah. as a sacrifice. It's insane. Do you know? Yeah. About yeah, yeah. I mean, they. I mean, it is a satanic ritual mm -hmm. to murder your own child. And it's the same thing as like Baal, like right? What? I mean, you see that probably it's just the same spirit, yep. just in modern day. Yeah, well, th that's why you see outside of abortion clinics. I mean. Um, you know, you, who, who, who are the people escorting the women in? It's usually, you know, volunteers, mm -hmm. and most of them are gay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're lesbian or transgender, and it's the two go hand in hand. And our abortion clinic here in town, it's on a dead end street. At the front of the street is the pregnancy center, first choice pregnancy center. And at the end um, of the cul de sac, you have a pornography studio uh -huh. and an abortion wow. clinic. It's like, what are the odds that those yeah. things are right next to each other? Quite high. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, we take our children today after we murder them, we take their bodies to a medical waste facility where we incinerate. Mm. So still to this day, we are sacrificing mm. our children to Moloch. Mm. And so then you have to look at, okay, like what does God tell us to do about that? Mm. And, you know, it goes back to judges. You have Gideon inside you know his cave and he's threshing the wheat and they come down and they say look it i need you to go into that city i need you to burn down their idols mm -hmm. um you know and i i tweeted something the other day i said if jesus flipped tables and made a whip mm. because they were selling doves inside the temple yeah. what do you think he would do if they saw what they were selling inside the abortion clinic mm -hmm. yeah. and you know that's the truth is we have to do anything and everything uh, to stop this. And you get further into sort of theology, you get into the idea of, of blood guiltiness mm. and you f find out that it, it's not just that we have this duty to stop it. It's that if we don't, 
the blood's on our Amen. hands for allowing. That's that's so cool you said that because that's my verse. You know, people say I'm pretty radical. I loved what I don't know if you remember this, but you said I'm pretty radical because we said for you to come speak, and you said I'm pretty radical. And then my one of our congregation members goes, "Well, our pastor's pretty radical too." Radical so I mean, uh, <laughs> radical rotors, my nickname. But uh, but the verse that motivates me because you just don't want to be radical for radical sake, right? Before Christ, I was radical, but for stupid stuff. Mm. But it's like the verse that motivates me. What you said, Ezekiel thirty three three. If you see the enemy, the watchman on the wall. If you see the enemy coming. You do not warn the people, their blood is upon your head. But if you warn the people and they don't take heed, then their blood is upon their own head. Yeah. And then the other verse, I was just saying this the other last week, but like Paul, where he says in Acts 20, I did not shun to give you the whole counsel of God. But right before that, he goes, the blood of no man is on my head, meaning I don't have the blood of any man because why? I gave you the whole counsel of God. I told you everything. And, and that's what I see too. It's funny. I don't want to get into this, you're probably, but I see as a lot of pastors, it's not that they're heretical in what they say. It's just what they're leaving out. They're not talking about hell. They're not talking about sin. They're not talking about abortion because Sexuality. those are unpopular things. But those are the most important things because how will they know unless a preacher sent? If we don't say anything, they're going to, right? I, I saw that with homosexuality. A lot of the churches was kind of like uh, the military with Clinton. Don't ask, don't tell. But if you don't fill that, that void with truth, you'll eventually have homosexual rampant, which we do. And I even, when I speak on it in the church in Calvary, mm -hmm. you see people go, oh, they freak out. Like, you can't say that. And I'm like, no, I can say that because it's the word of God. It's mm -hmm. true. It's a sin, just like any, you're right. And, and I, I don't know if you know Beckett Cook. Do you know Beckett Cook? It's funny. But anyway, he's a, he's a guy who's homosexual. He's become a Christian. But he said, uh, he goes, it is worse than any other sexual sin because it's the first thing in Romans. And I go, well, I'll let you say that being gay. But, you know, it's sin, and we need to call it just like we, we don't celebrate adulterous Christians. We don't sell. I mean, there are Christians committing adultery, but we don't celebrate it yet. We don't celebrate fornicating Christians, but yet we celebrate people who come up to me. Moms will say, my son loves Jesus and is a homosexual Christian living with his significant other. And I'm like, and I have to be the bearer of bad news is saying that's not biblical that's not right because the bible says homosexuals adulterers fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of god and i say so you know there you can be like it says in the first corinthians 6 14 such were some of you right <laughs> we could all be a former a fornicator adulterer a homosexual but you can't be practicing and say everything is cool with jesus so. Yeah. Amen. So. yeah i mean the bible says that homosexuality is an abomination yeah. right i mean that's that's harsh words yeah. and to ignore that it's like you're you're watching someone run off a cliff mm. like, how much do you have to hate that guy not to tell him the truth like hey there's a cliff over there mm. like you must have to hate that person yeah. Yeah. to be worried about uh, him whatever they have to think or to say and the awkwardness that might come with it it's like yeah. awkward or not I, I i would prefer to warn you of the yeah. cliff that's uh, in your impending doom that's yeah. coming. I think too, I don't know if you um, agree, but I think what a lot of, you know, I'm not trying to undo what you said, but you know, we always say uh, like psychology, I forget who said it. Some Christian psychologist said the opposite of hate is not as, I mean, the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. And I think it's apathy. Like, well, you know, it's kind of like the old hippie thing. I was a hippie live and let live, you know, Hey man, let you do you. Right but it's like, really we have to realize, like you said, that it's almost to the point of apathy really is hatred because you don't care. You should care, right? Restrain those who are being led to death, as it says in Proverbs. And mm -hmm. yet we just kind of go, mm, because people you know, say that, like, they're well, going to do whatever. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't do it personally as like a Christian, but, you know, you can, you, yeah. you do you. you like, and that's what makes me really sad. And, and I also am really thankful you even being a man doing this because I think men get a lot of attack in this, like, in the realm of even pro-life because they're like what you don't know anything like you're a man and you're set i'm just kidding i'm like who but are you could say today exactly i represent as a woman like, no, right you could say no i'm just kidding I was, <laughs> I that joke, so don't persecute just, me <laughs> but it's just like they always say uh no uterus no opinion <laughs> yeah, so i thought yeah. about tattooing a uterus on my yeah, arm there you so go. Like, exactly. like i got it right yeah. here Pop but we need yeah. the men to stand up yeah. and protect the women, and I see you doing that That's it, yeah. and caring about. So can you share a little bit about what you do, like when you have a name of a baby or a mom? Not a baby. I've heard the story of the baby that was put on your lap and the one that you I were able to yeah. say. But do you want to share what you do with that? That's cool. 
Yeah, so every skyscraper I climb, we raise money for a woman who is in crisis pregnancy. And 73% of abortions are done because of financial circumstances. Mm. So if we can help these women out with their rent or whatever else they need, sometimes like it's as small as like their transmissions out on their car mm. and they're panicking because it's like, oh, if I can't, you know, have a transmission, how am I going to afford this kid? How am mm. I going to drive this baby? Mm. So it's like, what if I just fix your transmission for you? Mm. And so we'll raise money for these women. And so every skyscraper we climb, we save uh, a baby from being murdered. Um, and what I'm trying to do now, uh, I just started my own organization, the Anti-Abortion Front, a little plug there. Okay. Um, but I, I say there's two strategies in the pro-life movement, and both are righteous, right? Like one is like what I was doing before, where there's babies floating down this river, and we pull them out of the river. And then the other one is you know, to try to stop them from being thrown in the river in the first place. And that's where we see this sort of verifiable victory. And again, both are righteous. Uh, you know, I, I see, uh, you know, saving a baby from being murdered. That's, it's, it's a big win, right? One day you're going to meet these children when you go to heaven. You're going to sit on the table of saints and all the babies you don't even know that you've saved, you, you will meet, uh, which is a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful thing to think about. But, um, you know, we have to strive towards a, a, a total end of abortion. And what that means is, is looking at the movements that have come before us, right? So let's take uh, the founding fathers. They had five things, all these movements had five things in common. Number one was like radical rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So the founding fathers, they said, join or die, mm -hmm. right? Um, the civil, uh, the slavery, they said that, uh, you know, slavery is an abomination. Mm. They used these strong words. And uh, what is the pro-life movement? What are we doing right now? We're saying celebrate life. Mm. And I'm like, no, Stop like I, I didn't come to this march for life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came here to mourn the death mm. of the 70 million babies mm. that have been murdered in the womb. I didn't come here to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Right. Our time to celebrate is when we win, mm -hmm. when we stop babies from being murdered. Mm. Um, the second thing that all of these movements do is they have graphic pictures, yeah. right? On the founding fathers, they didn't have photos, so they used political cartoons. Yeah. But let's look at, for instance, when we think of the greatest atrocity of all time, we all think of usually the Holocaust, mm -hmm. right? However, Stalin killed over 10 times the people that Hitler could have ever dreamed mm -hmm. of killing. And when we think of the greatest atrocity, we think of the Holocaust. The reason that is, is because we've all seen the photos of the victims, mm. uh, the Jews who were dead bodies piled, stacked high, starved, mm. skinny, and, and beaten. And that had an effect on us, mm -hmm. and it never leave our mind. Yep. So when you see a dead baby, there's no denying what that mm. is. Right? Our, our eyes cannot lie to our hearts. Mm. The words can be ignored, although they're important, they can be ignored, but our eyes can't lie to our hearts. Mm. And... So that's an important thing that most of the pro-life movement is leaving out because they're worried about offending. Mm -hmm. They're worried about people with children. What if the children sees? And, you know, honestly, children can handle much more yeah. than what we believe them to be. Yeah. And it's it's honestly, it's better to show it to them yeah. while they're young, yeah. while their heart, before their hearts have hardened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we mm -hmm. let kids you do wait. watch horror movies and celebrate, like, how we do all hopefully. this. <laughs> Not we, but, like... Yeah. Even the, but churches yeah. do yeah. and like yeah. they allow it and think it's fine. I'm like, kids do that in scary stuff. Yeah. I'm like, they need to know what is actually scary and dark and yeah. demonic. But to confirm so. what you said, Mason, is this when I saw those forceps that uh, the doctor used to pull that really rocked me. And so like I totally affirm the the visual aids yeah, visual because itself. it's sort of like like I said, if you don't see it, right? It's cool. It's like, it's all right. Hey, I don't care. You know, and I, and I will say to my shame, I was raised in the hippie movement in Oregon. And so it's sort of like, Hey, if you allow abortion, every baby will be a wanted baby and there'll be no more poverty and all that baloney and yet child abuse. And there'll be no more child abuse and child abuse has gone up 400% yeah. since then. So it's like, if I can take you out in the womb, I can take you out afterwards. Right. It's totally a lie. Mm -hmm. But, but I can say to my shame, even as a young pastor, I was just sort of like, well, you know, yeah, it's bad, but you know, I don't know. 
And I just can, I don't know if you want to say this, but I'll just be weird since around, but it's like, it's funny when you came to our church, it seemed like most of the people on the group were Catholic, you know, even right Catholic. Why does it seem like Catholics? I mean, is it a workspace thing? Why is it Catholics are so into this and so few, you don't see as many radical like yourself, yeah. born again Christians or people who would say Protestant doing this. Like what, what is the, what, cause when we go, when I do the, uh, 40 days for life. And I pray a ton of the people are Catholic. And I just, I, I mean, I love that, but I'm going, why is the well, Protestant church? So Catholic. what? 40 days for life is Catholic and founded. Okay. Well, but I'm just saying we don't have as many, I mean, <laughs> most of the people there are our church yeah, yeah, out of a town of a million people. So can you speak to that being a former Catholic and just going, what is, like, yeah. what's the deal there? I just kind of, and I'm asking, I don't even know. I'm just going, what is it? <laughs> There's, there's lots of reasons for one. I mean, you, you could look at, um, you know, just the design of the Catholic church. They're able to mobilize faster because it's, it's more like a dictatorship mm. in the sense that, Hey, put this message out. They're going to put the message out where, uh, you know, even Calvary chapel, it, it's sort of like, yeah, you're a part of Calvary chapel, but you're your own church. So you're saying I should become so a dictator. More... <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's more organization no. within that. No. That's part of it. Yeah. But the other part of it is, yes, it is partially. I, I don't even think that it, because of that, it's you know, faith plus works. Mm. I, I think it you know is more like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer mm. said. Uh, you know, the church had uh, come across this idea of cheap grace, mm. right? Like, oh, I'm saved, so I'm good. Yeah. Uh, when in reality, like, faith without works is yeah. death, yeah, and you will know them by their fruit. Exactly. And so a good tree will bear good fruit and a bad tree will bear bad fruit yeah. and have their limbs chopped off and thrown in the lake of fire. Exactly. So it's, it's just because we're saved doesn't mean we uh, can be silent. Mm. It, it means the act actually the opposite. It yeah. means we have the duty yeah. to go out and protect these children and to share the gospel with everybody we meet. Mm. And um, I think that's the biggest problem is, is that the Protestant church has ignored, you know, certain verses that, you know, kind of make it our, our duty as, as men of faith to go yeah. out and, and do these things. Yeah. I think, um, I think it's like what you said is that as I see in Calvary, we're so, you know, kind of, I'd say, cause I was a Catholic too, that you're a little more works based, right. As a Catholic, right. That's why the Protestant reformation, but now we've gone the other extreme of grace of like, it was says in Romans one, should we sin that grace might abound? And Paul says, no, but we've sort of gone, yeah, I have grace. I can do whatever. And we have to see that our apathy is sin to like you always quote is Bonhoeffer to say nothing is to say something. If to not speak is to speak, we have to realize that we are, re I love what Keith Green said. We are responsible for this generation of souls. Yeah. We are responsible for the generation of souls we're a part of. And I blame, I say, I take responsibility being in ministry 43 years. This happened on my watch. This liberal kind of sin, like, you know, grace, sin that grace might abound has happened on my watch. And that's why I've become more radical as I've gotten older, not less. I was probably a little more hippie in the beginning with more grace, <laughs> but now I'm getting a little more intense where people say, whoa, dude. But I'm like, whoa, dude, it isn't working. This, this sloppy agape, this cheap grace ain't working. We're going the other extreme, right? Satan will get us one extreme or the other. Either yeah. workspace, which is dead, or grace that doesn't change your life. Like, oh, I can sin that grace mm -hmm. might abound. And we got to find that balance of, we do good works not to be saved, but we do good works because I'm saved. I like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. I am what I am by the grace of God. And because of the grace of God, I work harder than all the apostles, but not I, but the grace of God. So true grace mm -hmm. should work not to be saved, but because you are saved. So yeah. anyway, right. didn't mean to preach there. Yeah. And, and that sort of um, going back to, you know, the five tools that every movement has used. Uh, you know, we had uh, radical rhetoric, incendiary images, and one of the most important ones is uh, aggressive action, mm. right? And that's a part that is also kind of frowned upon in the church. Yeah. You look at uh, the founding fathers, they threw the tea in the river, mm -hmm. which I, I don't think that that is the most Christian thing to do is to steal someone's tea and <laughs> throw it in the river. Uh, but something like a sit in, yeah. right? Uh, that the people of the civil rights movement did, yeah. uh, they, they had to do that. Or like climbing like a building. Number four, climbing a building is a perfect <laughs> example. It hurts nobody, yep. 
Yeah. Uh, there's no victims yourself. to it. And, yeah. Yeah. But rule number four goes hand in hand with rule number three, and that's serious sacrifice. It mm. will follow, and it is required mm. if we want to see victory. Mm. Uh, I like to look at the apostles for this. Everywhere they went, they were beaten, stoned, thrown in jail, and beheaded. Yet they still kept going because they knew if they didn't that their neighbor's souls would be damned to hell. Mm. So out of love for their neighbor and out of faith in Jesus Christ and his commandments, they went out at any cost to themselves. Mm. And, you know, I've been to jail um, several times now. I think like nine times, about to be Mm. ten. But um, it's not that bad. It's not like what the apostles had to go through. Definitely got I love, you, I love from your story the, about the Crips of the Blood. Blood. Good, tell that story. Yeah. That's a pretty cool story. Have, like, yeah. All right. at, at the end of the day, jail in the modern world is, 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 is a timeout for yeah. adults. Yes. That's all it is. It's not, like, it's not like Paul at his Mamertine prison sitting in the death cell with urine and feces on him. I'm thinking I've been to jail and it's, yeah, it's nothing like that. That's for sure. Sometimes there's urine and feces. Yeah, like, but you get yeah but you're not sitting in it. You're just around it. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. No. I, I like to, to tell people, it, it's like the Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. So I question, what would you do to save your own children from being murdered? Yeah. What would you do? How many nights in jail would you be willing to spend? One, two, three. Would you spend a month in jail to save your own child from being murdered? Mm-hmm. How much money would you spend? Would you spend a thousand? Would you spend two thousand? Mm. And you know, you should be doing that for these babies, for God's children that are being murdered in the womb. Because less than a mile from where most people live, there are babies being murdered every single day. My abortion clinic in town is just four miles from my house, mm. and every single day there are over thirty babies killed in that building. Wow. 30 is it a slaughterhouse is what that place is and, and and so we have to ask ourselves what would we do to save our own children now what would we do to stop 30 babies from being murdered mm-hmm. right yeah. what would you do and then you need to go out and do it Amen. um and until we start thinking like that in, in sort of i guess these philosophically consistent terms we will continue to lose and you know in in philosophy you have valid in sound and so valid would be like a um, muslim jihadist Mm. right like if the quran is true then this Mm. makes sense um and you know sound would be christianity like we know jesus is true so then this makes sense Uh, i'm butchering my definition of of, of these two things hopefully there's no philosophy Mm. professors (laughs) listening Mm -hmm. but the pro-life movement for you know, the last 50 years has been falling away from um, both validity and soundness mm. because you know if, if abortion is murder, then we have to act like it, and we're simply not. Mm. We're, we're we're compromising in every, every regard. It's it's really sad to see, um, and so until we start to treat abortion like murder, we will not yeah. ever ever uh, see victory. Yeah. yeah, it's weird. It's like I don't know, you know. Well, you want to say, but I just see uh, the word. I guess the nice word, the wussification of the church. I mean, we've kind of, we've kind of. It's like, like I said, when I speak about homosexuality or even abortion, but mostly homosexuality, you can see the church's <gasps> gulp, and you're just like, what am I? I'm like you said, we teach verse by verse, book by book, chapter by chapter. What part of this is not? true in the bible so it's like that you know let god be true and be a liar we should say it's in the bible craig's not just saying this it's in the bible so it should be amen like man this is kind of hard because our society is saying hey let it you know free cho- you know free a woman's choice but it isn't a woman's choice right it's a different blood type a lot of times it's it's a it's another life you do not have the right to tear that baby apart or have it torn apart i should say and i think we just have to, like you said, I, I like that, you know, that we have to get radical again. We've kind of, mm-hmm. and it's so funny. It's sad for me because the more radical I get, the more people go, whoa, and kind of, like I've had people, this is what's funny. I just said this a couple weeks ago. I had these people that, that said, Craig, I love you. Say the hard things. I dig it. It's awesome. Speak, preach the word, 
preached the whole council of God. And now they just left our church to go to a church where the guy just, uh, when he taught Romans one, he left out all the part of homosexuality. And I'm just going, you know what I mean? That's just heartbreaking to a pastor. Cause I'm going, okay, you told me that was awesome. But then when it somehow, I don't know how I offended Something them. Now they're them. going to a liberal church. And, uh, you know, I just, it, we, I guess we just have to, like you said, or not you said, but uh, I think John Quincy Adams said, our sixth president, president, we God's called us to do our duty and the results are up to him. And we got to just mm-hmm. keep being faithful. And if people, and hopefully enough people like yourself rise up to be mm-hmm. radical and hopefully an attitude is easier caught than taught and you inspire people to say, well, if he can climb a building, if he can go to jail, hey, maybe I can actually go and do 40 days for life and pray. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, you know what I mean? That we motivate by example not just by wor- mm-hmm. mere words you know so well well people um like pastors are more concerned that their pews are full than they are of heaven yeah. being full and pleasing god it's yeah. the, the sad thing and Amazing. you see like the feminization of the church mm-hmm. it's why that more men are willing to sign up to go to fight the globalists wars overseas whatever mm-hmm. they may be run across minefields and get shot at. They're more willing to do that than they are to sign up to be a missionary where they're probably going to be shot at. Yeah. It's, they, they would rather go sign up with the globalists than the church leaders. And, you know, I forget what the statistic is, but I think it's, you know, women to men in the missionary field is seven to one. Mm. And I, I, I think, you know, that's a missionary field in, in general, not to get off topic, but I think that's another um, problem too is that we only see the missionary field as you know places overseas and in Africa, mm-hmm. but in reality, it's like Amen. our missionary field is here. Yeah, we need to Amen. fix the people we are around, yep. and then we can go out. Yep. And that's what I always uh, say. Like how many? I always say that Mason is that uh, the the English the, in England back in the early eighteen or nineteen hundreds. They were sending out, I believe, 70 to 75% of the world's missionaries. And now they're only five, four to three, four to three to four percent church because they didn't send missionaries to themselves. So here they're putting missionaries everywhere else, but they didn't mission. And that's where my heart is to do home missions. I mean, I, I'm all about missionaries around the world, but I really feel America, because I heard an Indian lady that we support said, if we lose, if America falls, we'll lose most of our support because America it, it funds a lot of our things. So it's like, and you see that, and I, I don't know, well, hopefully your end times is Calvary end times, but it's like, <laughs> we know it's going to get worse. And we know, I was thinking about that when you see all this insanity, giving money away, everything, we don't have money. It's because we have to fall to be ready for a one world leader. We have to, America has to fall. That's why the Muslims call us the, you know, the little Satan is Israel and America is the great Satan because we kind of protect and fund. So you realize that's where it's going. You know, I'm not into all these conspiracy because I hear every conspiracy in the world, but that is America needs to fall, you know, for this to happen. And you see that happening, you know? Yeah. It's sort of like Bonhoeffer said, he said, um, you know, there needs to be external forces to free people from their internal chains. But on the topic of, of home missions, it's like, when was the last time you heard of a church sending uh, missionaries to San Francisco? Mm. Like why, why are, like, why can't we do a mission trip to San Francisco? Cause it's like, have you been there? Yeah. Have you seen what's happening? It's, it, it's like going into Sodom yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, yeah, we're shipping people across the world and, we're creating almost like this culture of like missionary vacations. And yeah. It's yeah, like, well, no, there's work that needs to be done yeah. all around our, 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 our own nation. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the other thing uh, on the topic of, you know, preaching the truth and, and sort of this radical idea, it's, it's, it, it works. Mm. And you do see that people will be inspired um, by it. And it's what I say to pastors all the time when, very few pastors actually let me come speak at their churches for the reason being that I am a bit radical. Yeah, we're gonna I, I you find come, it bud. funny because they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll preach about Bonhoeffer hmm. and then they say, I'm too radical. And it's like, well, did you not know that like Bonhoeffer tried to kill Hitler? <laughs> exactly. I haven't tried to kill anybody. Yeah. Like yeah. Kill yeah. I'm a peaceful dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, the, the thing I love to do is to show the babies Will it make people cry? Absolutely. No. Will it ruin their day? No. Yes. Will it keep them up all night? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
but you have to be kept up all night if you want to know the reality of what this is. They're going to be brewing up. It's going to bother them. It's like they're going to have nightmares about it, but that's good because at least they'll know the truth. And when you preach the truth, you you you, you see different results. Like this tour I was on, I wasn't allowed to show the babies. And um, most churches I spoke at, I got a standing ovation, um, which was good. But when I show the babies, it's not a standing ovation that I get. It is, how do I help? Mm. What can I do? It's an entirely different response mm. that I get. And um, you, you see people start to get involved when, when you preach the truth. And they start to think the same way you do. And yeah. um, a month and a half ago, I started um, – the doctor coined the term. He called it a crusade. He was mad at me. Mm. Um, I found out that our local abortionist here in town – was also a pedophile. Oh wow! Oh, and Levy. yeah, yeah, Doctor Doctor Levy, and he had um, you know raped his own daughters, mm. horrible, terrible, wow. and got away with it. Basically, oh. he, he got a, a plea deal, and he bargained it down to uh, probation mm. for all the disgusting crimes that I would not like to go into. But um, I needed help, mm. so I had bought plane tickets for about. 15 people. I used my own money and some money that people had donated. I, I think I spent on my own money, like $6,000 to wow. do it because I'm like, this guy needs to be taken down. And when all these people were flying out, they'd call me on the phone and they'd say, Mason, um, we're not going to get, like, are we going to get arrested? Cause I can't get arrested. <laughs> and I'm saying, no, <laughs> it's not that kind of yeah. activism. I'm, at, I'm on trial for conspiracy right now in Las Vegas. So out of all the places, Las Vegas, I certainly cannot be arrested at. And so they came out here with that mentality, and I showed them a documentary. It's called um, The Brutal Truth. It's about Operation Rescue, which was the largest civil disobedience movement of all time. And uh, we, we actually don't like to use that word. We like to say biblical obedience movement yeah. because – you know, they were rescuing those who were being led into death, yeah. holding back those who were stumbling to the slaughter. They were doing sit-ins at abortion clinics. Mm. And it was over 70,000 people that were arrested during Operation Rescue. They were all Christians. Mm. And on my wall, I'm framing this photo of this old lady. And the police, they would come and they would say, if you get up right now, I'm not going to hurt you. Mm. But if you don't, I'm going to beat you silly. And this old grandma knelt back down to pray. And the police beat her and they threw her on the pavement like she was George Floyd. This was somebody's wow. grandma. But she had true faith, mm -hmm. enough faith to be beaten. Yeah. So I showed these young people this documentary and I just I, I preached to them as much as we could and during our fellowship. And within two days, all of these kids who had called me and told me they don't want to be arrested said, we want to do a sit in in the UNLV president's office. Wow. Um. That's and cool. so, yeah, they were arrested. I, yeah. I, I felt bad because I couldn't go, mm -hmm. but they didn't care. Yeah. Praise God. They said, we will go yeah. with or without you. We understand that you can't go because of legal reasons, but we want to go. So we're going to do it. Yeah. And um, that's awesome. Yeah. So we know the truth. Yeah. We know the truth wins. Amen. And it's like, it's like when Mariah Amen. said, Revelation 12, 11, that uh, the, the blood of the lamb, that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of the testament, did not love their lives so much to shrink from death. And I, you know, it's like, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really n cool. Like when it acts where they said, praise God, we were, we were worthy to be beaten for the sake of Christ. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like, as long as you're not being a punk and where God's like, whoa, whoa, what do you do? But when you're standing for righteousness <laughs> and you get arrested, that is cool. I mean, it really, I believe it brings a smile to God's face that you're willing to suffer for the sake of Christ and in love. I and think like that I'm thankful that for you too, because my husband he always loves how um, he's climbing buildings now. Yeah, okay. He wants to, right? But my husband, he, he was like, yeah. it was cool for him just to think about Richard Wormbrand and how his wife told him, like when he was about to be arrested, he, she said, I did not marry a coward. And he always tells me, he's like, babe, don't let me be a coward. Like, don't mm. let me, let me be willing. I'm like, even if we had like our five, six kids and he needed to do something to be arrested, like I would want to have that faith to be like, be able to be without him so that he could help someone else, even though that'd be difficult. And I'm thankful for, he looks at you and he's like, I want to be like Mason. Like I want to be like that and that radicalness. So just even the inspiration you have towards other men, like be encouraged by that, be encouraged that you're strengthening them to say like, 
if he can do it, I can do it. And I want to do it by the grace and strength of God. And so realizing that you guys are protecting these women, you are protecting these babies and me being a mom, I'm very grateful for you and I'm very thankful. Mm. And it makes me emotional because I'm like, Thank you. it's so <laughs> cool to see a young man like you being willing to sacrifice his life, even to the fact where it'd be hard for you to like have a wife, like who would be like, who would be like, hey, you what? give yourself Don't be up. Putting ideas. No, no, Don't listen, get that but idea I'm meaning there. like someone to be like, I do not receive that. Name, that you know. sounds bad. <laughs> but like someone who would be radical, you would also, they would want you to. So just to be encouraged, like yeah. there are people out there. Just have good life insurance. <laughs> no, but be encouraged. Oh, and anything else you want to share? Any last thoughts? Because I know you had to leave like five minutes ago. Um, and then where we can find you and support and all that. So the thing is, is I don't have a lot. So I have, I've got nothing. I've got nothing to lose, right? If the government wants to come after me, they're going to get my $500 car. <laughs> big <whoop. laughs> But we will continue to struggle and these babies will continue to be murdered until those who have the most to lose yeah. start standing up to defend these children. And, and as far as like politically in our, in our country, like, you know, what they're, scared of losing mm. until, until they start protecting what they have they, they will continue to lose it slowly and slowly and slowly and slowly and our, our babies will continue to be slaughtered and I, I tell these people that you need to stand up and protect what you have until it you know or, or it will be too late yeah. and that jail cell that you'll go to it, it, it's not the valley of the shadow of death mm. right like the bible says we walk through the valley of the shadow of death we shall fear no evil because thou art with us and that jail cell it's not the valley of the shadow of death mm. sure it smells like pain it smells like urine and it's going to be hard to sleep but what is one you know bad night of, of rest right mm. if you save a baby from being murdered mm. right it's not the valley of the shadow of death, but you should have the same courage there as if it was. Because if you don't, if you don't have that courage now, what makes you think that you're going to have it later? Amen. Exactly. Can't, yeah, you can't so, stand for God in the life situations. They say, how can you stand for God in the death situations? Yeah. Right. And I love what uh, I think it was Dennis Prager and what he called, said that we, it, everyone says, oh, I would have stood up for the hol against the Holocaust. And he goes, nope. no, you wouldn't have. Most of people wouldn't do that yeah. and so we need to do that right we need and i i just want to say this i know i got to go my 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 wife my your daughter no but she says uh that that we have to go but i'm just saying is i just thank you for helping de-wussify the church yeah. and so keep it up <laughs> and i'm gonna let you come <laughs> and make men of us at our church at calvary River valley yeah <laughs> Bless you, man. yeah so thank you i appreciate hey, and i want it. you can and you that... pray for us can you pray for the church and pray for just pray for us to stand up as a church as the church absolutely Absolutely. And um, right now, or yeah, right now, I'll close it out <laughs> yeah. in prayer. Well, God, we, we thank you so much for the courage shown here by uh, you know, Calvary Chapel and Pastor Craig. And we ask that you, you be their shield, God, and you, you lead them towards truth and, and you bring them courage and show them just what they are capable of. They do not need to hide from truth. Mm. They do not need to hide like Adam and Eve in the garden, but they can stand with courage just like David did when he was confront when he confronted Goliath, God. And give them the strength and be their both their shield and their sword. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this episode. And also share this with any of your friends who maybe are struggling with understanding why we need to stand up for the babies that are being murdered. Also, if you'd like to listen to us, you can listen to us on any of the podcast platforms. Just type in Calvary Conversations. And please make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations and follow Mason. You can look at all his links in the description below as we would like to support him and encourage him in what he's doing. And again, be radical. And we love you guys so much. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much and God bless.